I'm really delighted about this next session with Dr. Wei Jin Shen. He's chairman and CEO of PAG, a private equity firm, which manages more than 35 billion US dollars. Previously, he was a partner of TPG, a private equity firm based in my hometown, San Francisco. He was co-managing partner of TPG Asia. He's led a number of landmark transactions including the acquisitions of Korea First Bank and China's Shenzhen Development Bank. He's been a managing director of JP Morgan, a professor at the Wharton School. He has a master's and PhD from UC Berkeley, an MBA from the University of San Francisco. And the amazing part is he never went to high school or even middle school. So let's start. Uh, you know, part of the hardest part about lockdown for me has been, in fact, for everyone, has been that we didn't choose this. We didn't choose to be locked away from friends, from travel, from work, from school. But you didn't choose what happened to you during the Cultural Revolution. So I wonder if you can talk to me a little bit about what happened to you from the age of 12, when for 10 years school was canceled. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I was just about to graduate from elementary school when I was 12. Then the Cultural Revolution in China broke out. That particular event threw the entire society into chaos. The direct consequence of it was all the schools were shut down. Initially, I was pretty happy. I was about to graduate from elementary school. I thought we were going to have a longer vacation than we ever had in the past. And I was looking forward to it. But I didn't know at the time that this so-called cultural revolution lasted for 10 years, during which time none of us was able to go back to school anymore. So for 10 years, we were out of school, and for most of those 10 years, I became a hard laborer in the Gobi Desert part of China, which is the reason why my book is titled Out of the Gobi, because I spent so many years working as a hard laborer in the Gobi Desert. So in, lieu of, in lieu of secondary school. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, your time in the Gobi de Desert. Uh, on the cover of the book, which I've got on my uh, on my iPad, you've got on the um, on the book just behind you. It shows you running away, but in fact, that's a picture that your publisher took from another picture, right? About you actually running towards a bull. Now, tell me about that. How did you figure out about running towards a bull actually makes it running away? No. The original photo, in fact, shows me chasing a bull. And the bull was running away, and I was chasing it. I think the publisher doctored the photo and took away the bull. I rather like that bull. <laughs> and so the result is the picture that you see on the cover of the book. And that was actually myself. And a friend of mine by the name of Liu Xiaotong was an avid photographer, even when we were teenagers. And he had a very old camera that he got from his father. And he took a number of pictures. And the cover of the book, you know, had, you know that picture was taken by him. Tell me about those friends. Tell me about uh, how you kept yourselves occupied. How did he, did he develop pictures in the Gobi Desert? Yes. See, all of us had to spend time doing hard labor every day in the fields, on the farmland. In winter time, it was extremely cold, minus 20, 30 degrees very often Celsius, freezing cold. We had to work on the lake, frozen lake, to cut reeds, 
which were sent to paper mills to turn into pulp. In summertime, under the blazing sun, we had to till the land and try to grow crops. Our job was supposed to grow crops in the middle of Gobi Desert. And we dug canals, we let irrigation water to the fields, which we plowed, and we worked extremely hard under the blazing sun in very hot summer, in desert weather, and trying to grow crops. But you can imagine how successful we were <laughs> trying to grow crops in the desert. And eventually, we couldn't grow enough to even recover a fraction of the seeds we sowed into the ground. And we certainly couldn't feed ourselves. So starvation was very frequent, and that was part of our life. But uh, my friends and I, there were 300 of us on one farm, uh, would work during the day. And after work at night, most people just waste their time away by playing poker, playing chess. And uh, I tried to educate myself. So I did study, which was frowned upon, and I got into trouble for being caught to study. But I did. So what this entire ordeal was over many years later, I was able to resume my education. But for most of my friends, they were not so lucky because after 10 years, without any education, without being able to study, they were, I would say, totally wasted. And when the Cultural Revolution was over, when people like my friend Liu Xiaotong, who took the picture, went back to the cities, it was exceedingly difficult for them to find a job without the requisite skills, without any knowledge, after having spent 10 years as hard laborers. So to this day, they live in relative poverty and at the bottom of society. And that happened to most of the people in my generation. How did you get the books that you read? I mean, when in the foreword to your book, Janet Yellen uh, says that she was surprised when she became your advisor at Berkeley, that you'd learned most of the math you'd learned, you'd learned by candlelight. How did you get those books if they were frowned upon? In fact, there were not many books. And there were very few books. And my study was totally random. It was not systematic at all. I just read whatever books I could lay my hands on, whatever books I could find. Sometimes I would find a high school chemistry book and I would read it as if I was reading a novel. I would just read it. And maybe a month or two later, I would find a junior high school chemistry book, a more junior level chemistry book, and I would read it again. And then, oh, something that I read about a couple of months ago, suddenly started to make sense. So that is really how I try to gain some knowledge. And it was totally random and no system at all. And that's why I, at one time when somebody asked me the same question, I said, my house of knowledge is built on sand because the foundation is so shaky, so weak, even though I have three graduate degrees, from America, even though I have a PhD, I taught at the Wharton School of University, University of uh, Pennsylvania. The foundation, my knowledge, is very shaky because we missed 10 years of secondary education. But I was able to read uh, whatever I was able to, uh, whatever books I could find. And, and therefore, I must say that my knowledge is also quite broad.
So tell me about some of the people that you were there with. You had a friend who was a pilot uh, and through some of those people, actually, we, we, we learn about the history of, of China during that time, during the Cultural Revolution. Tell me about him. The Cultural Revolution was a tragedy because so many intellectuals were persecuted as government officials, as bureaucrats, but so many intellectuals were persecuted for harboring capitalistic ideas or bourgeoisie tendencies. And in one chapter in my book, I described an elder gentleman in his late 50s. He was the foremost aviation expert in China. He was trained in the United States during the war when China and America were allies with each other in the war effort. And he flew jets, airplanes for the old regime of Kuomintang. And then in 1949, he and his comrades defected from the old regime to the communist side, flying 12 aircraft, aviation, uh, civilian aircraft from uh, Hong Kong all the way to Beijing to defect from the old regime to the communist government. This was in January in 1949. But when the Cultural Revolution, of course, he was regarded as hero for having done what he did in 1949. And he was paid a very high salary by the standard of that time. Even when he was in the Gobi, his salary was 60 times <laughs> mine. So it was, you know, I was receiving five yuan or just about a dollar a month. He was receiving 300 yuan. But when the Cultural Revolution came, he was accused by the Red Guards as, of course, the American spy or Guomindang spy. And uh, he was accused as being a capitalistic uh, authority in aviation. So he was exiled to the Gobi to do hard labor together with us. And uh, his job, I think everybody, where we were, really loved him, including the leaders. So they assigned him to what we consider to be not so hard a job, that is herding pigs. So that was his job. He was herding a few pigs. And his salary was many times more per year than the pigs he was raising. Uh, and I spent a lot of time with him. He told me things about um, America, about the world outside of China, he told me about his experiences, and I shared books with him. And eventually, he retired. He left the Gobi and went back to his hometown. Uh, the reason that I wrote this chapter is because that period of time wasted so many talents. And his is just a reflection an example of the waste that the Cultural Revolution caused uh, in the Chinese society. First of all, for 10 years, for the entire country of China's size, at that time, 800 million people, there was no education for 10 years. Think about the waste of human resources, and human capital. And then, of course, all the intellectuals, or most of them, were persecuted or sent to do jobs which are which were totally irrelevant to what their expertise were, uh, or what their expertise was. So he was just one example of it. And I think it's a very vivid example. So you write about uh, and have spoken about those extreme temperatures. And it's really struck me thinking about you out on the ice, trying to cut reeds in minus 10 degrees and it's hard labor so you need somehow to get water but all the water is underneath you frozen just tell me about what that was like how did you get water to drink tell me about that feeling because it has got to be i mean there's a there's a lot of words there's 
I think the word resilient gets overused in this time of, of lockdown, but that must have been a moment when you learned resilience. Uh, but tell me about tell me about that experience of cutting reeds in the freezing, freezing cold and trying to keep warm and trying to get water. Edie, I think you should let your audience read the book and then they can read the story. Uh, but uh, I, I think you raise a very interesting point. We're doing hard labor on ice, you know, on the frozen lake. In deep winter, it's extremely cold. The job was very hard. We had to cut half metric ton of reeds, dry reeds, per person per day. And before you finish, you couldn't go back to rest and couldn't get your second meal. So the hardest thing was not having enough to eat. And we were provided with two meals, one in the morning. After that meal, which was never enough, we would go onto the ice and to do this hard labor. The next meal would not be until about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon, after we finish our quarter, after we finish our job. And by very often one o'clock in the afternoon, I would uh, be so hungry and you feel chill inside out because it was cold. And if you don't have anything in your stomach, you feel even colder because you feel the chill from inside out. And that happened to all of us every day. And we had to bear the discomfort or pain of starvation. And at the time, in fact, I always thought it would be so wonderful if somebody can invent a pill and you take it and then you don't feel hungry anymore. It was not until many years later that I discovered there is such a thing called diet pill. <laughs> but uh, at the time it was really a dream that you could suppress your hunger by just taking a pill, then you wouldn't feel it. But I can tell you it was very, very painful. And then the hardest thing, of course, was thirst. There was no water, even though we stood on millions of gallons of water on the frozen lake. But the lake was frozen so much, the ice was half a meter or even deeper under our feet, so we couldn't get to the water. So we would use a sickle to try to dig out some ice on, on the surface of the lake and just suck on the ice. Uh, and in minus 10, 20 degrees temperature, it's exceedingly difficult to quench your thirst by sucking on ice. Ice will, will get stuck on your, on your tongue. And uh, so I would put few pieces of ice in my pocket and from time to time, and they won't melt because the weather is so cold. From time to time, I'll take them out and suck on them. And that's how we spend the day. Do you get the feeling that uh, people at the moment who have been locked down, who've been dealing with things that they've never had to deal with before, do you get the feeling sometimes going through what you've been with through that maybe we're all just complaining too much because actually people like you and like your friends, they got through a lot worse. Yes, but humans are humans. And humans are never content. I suppose you have been through, if you have been through hardships, you have tendency of being content. I am pretty content with my life today. Sometimes I marvel that I can have a full meal whenever I want. At one time, I was working on the transaction, which is described in my next book, which will come out in October of this year. We were holed up in the hotel, myself with my team, and teams from investment bank, uh, investment banks, accounting firms, and lawyers, and so forth. And we would order room service whenever we feel hungry. And I kept saying how wonderful it is whenever you want to eat, you know, you would have food. And finally somebody shouted out from the other side of the room, 
shut up, shut up. <laughs> Just eat. <laughs> You're no longer in the Gobi, so there's nothing wonderful about it. But to me, it's still a wonder that you could have food whenever you want to have food. Uh, so I suppose if you have been through some hardships, it's easier for you to feel satisfied. So at one point, you because you've been reading or caught reading a medical book, you become a, a, a doctor in, in your labor camp. But then you don't end up becoming a doctor later on. So I wonder why that is. Uh, uh, well, at the time, the system was called Barefoot Doctor, which I devoted a chapter to in the book. So the idea is that in the Chinese countryside, there was lack of medicine and many peasants didn't have access to medical care at all. Uh, many people who live their entire lives without ever seeing a doctor. So the idea was that uh, some of us would receive some basic training, then we would uh, start to treat everyday ailments. And uh, so I was actually appointed to receive training to become what was known as barefoot doctor, or I call myself a quack doctor. And I started to practice medicine and I did it for a quite a long time until I suppose I was not able to maintain good relationship with the leader of my company. You know, we were organized like an, a military. So there was a squad, there was a platoon, there was a company and there was a regiment. And I didn't have a very good relationship with uh, the company commander. And I suppose I didn't butter up to him <laughs> enough. So, so he fired me, that, that was very simple. So let's talk about what happens when you leave the camp and you are looking at going back to education. Tell me about that because it was not a smooth path despite the fact that you had been studying by candlelight at night. I wouldn't give out all the nuances, all the details, how I got out of the Gobi. I thought that was part of the suspension in the book and people want to find out how everything came to an end. But uh, please keep in mind that uh, the Cultural Revolution came to an end when Mao died. And then Deng Xiaoping came back to power and he took China onto a completely different path, which means economic reforms, open door policy. So along that time, this whole ordeal for my peers and myself came to an end and I was able to go back to Beijing to get education. And I studied English and eventually I found my way to the United States because China and America established diplomatic relationship in 1979 under President Jimmy Carter. And Deng Xiaoping visited America in 1979, which opened the door of China to America and vice versa. So I was one of very few people who were able to pass the tests to go to America to study. And altogether, I studied in America for six years, getting three graduate degrees. I don't know if it's uh, giving away a part of your book, but I would love you to tell the story of how you chose University of San Francisco. <laughs> uh, Yes, I did very well in the exam. I was number one uh, out of the contest. And I was given the choice of picking one of the best universities to visit on the list that uh, the president of the university where I was teaching, he went through with me. And the first on, on the list was Stanford. And he said, uh, Stanford, I've never heard of this school. 
you know, at that time, China was so closed from the rest of the world that we didn't know much about America at all. I never heard of Stanford either. So he said, well, that must be a, an obscure school. So he dismissed it. Uh, the second one was UC Berkeley. And he said, University of California, that sounds like a very good school because we all heard about California. But he said, at Berkeley, that sounds like a branch campus. And in China, if you don't qualify at that time for the main campus, you're sent to the branch campus. So he said, I can't send you to a branch campus. So he dismissed that one. The third one was University of San Francisco. Everyone in China knows San Francisco. And in China, many of the top schools have their names associated with uh, the names of the, the big cities, like Beijing University, Shanghai University, Xiamen University. So he said, that must be the best of the three. I didn't have anything to disagree with him. So that's where I was sent. And how did you decide what to study? Because you've said that you were a blank sheet of paper. Correct. At that time. Correct. I didn't care. I didn't care because when I was in the Roby, I didn't care what books I read. I just read whatever that was available. So when I went to America, I didn't expect, uh, no expectation what I would study. I thought, you know, in China at the time, there's no choice. You just do whatever your boss would tell you to do. And uh, so I thought somebody would tell me what to study. So when I got to America, somebody at the Asia Foundation, which sponsored me, uh, suggested that I study law. Uh, so, so I did. I went to the law school. But I also decided that since I could stay there only for one year, I couldn't possibly get a law degree. I thought I would study business as well so that perhaps I could compress the program from two years to one year and get a degree because my strong desire at the time was to get a real degree. <laughs> so I'll be considered to have received some formal education. And, and I did. So when I was first in America, I studied both law and the business and I was able to get an MBA degree. Now I went back to China and then I received acceptance letters from a number of universities into their PhD programs. And then I went back to America to do further studies. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Cultural Revolution and how it's appreciated or not in China now, because you've said that you're afraid that it's really little mentioned in China now and that that's dangerous. So I wonder if you could say a little more about that. The Cultural Revolution was a big disaster for China. For a nation of 800 million people, for 10 years, all the education stopped, much of the production stopped, everybody was involved in so-called revolution, and the society was in chaos. So many people were persecuted, young people were sent to the countryside, as intellectuals. So it was a huge waste for the country. It brought huge damages to the economy and to the lives of millions of people. And that was a lesson that should be learned. And that was the experience that shouldn't be repeated. Only by remembering history do we avoid making the same mistakes. And that's why I think the part of the history is very important. That's why I think my book is important. And that's the reason why I wrote the book, because it is the eyewitness account of the horrific stories which happened at that time. And we should remember that part of history. And do you think they're understood in China? Because your book isn't yet, or at least the last time I looked, wasn't published in China. Is that right? Well, I hope it will be published someday. We're working on it. Well, China is a country of uh, 
1.4 billion people about the same size as India. And uh, different people have different views. Some people feel very strongly about uh, the cultural revolution. Younger people probably don't know much about it. And uh, so I, not enough is talked about that period of time, and there should be more. And in fact, when you were asked to become an independent director of the China, China Merchant Bank, the fifth largest bank in China, in fact, your application didn't go through because, well, tell me well, that story. It was, uh, it was not an obligation. Uh, <laughs> I think in one of my interviews, I talked about that particular episode of my experience. I was invited to serve as independent director on the board of China Merchant Bank. That's right, you didn't really want to do it, right? Right, I was very busy at the time, but uh, the chairman of the board asked me to consider this as a public service. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And then, of course, for any bank, a director needs to be approved by the regulator. The regulator sent me a form to fill out. Among other things, I had to say, where I went to high school or secondary education. And I left it blank. And then an inquiry came through my secretary. Why did you leave that blank? So we sent back an answer. I have never been to a secondary school. And then another question came. And the question was, why did you not go to secondary school? So the cynical part of me took over and I simply said, well, for that question, you will have to ask the great leader, Jim and Ma. <laughs> so, as a result, they didn't approve me. <laughs> so I wonder if you can uh, tell me about, you know, a time now where we're in a, a situation or we're in a time when diplomatic relations between the US and China are not so great, but you know, this is not the first time things have been like this. And in fact, you know, as you've spoken about diplomatic relations originally established between China and the US 41 years ago, and you would think that, you know, perhaps China and the United States had less in common in the time of, of Jimmy Carter and Richard Nixon and Deng Xiaoping than perhaps now. And I wonder if you can talk a little about how you see where things might go. And if you think about conflict resolution is all about looking for the things you have in common. What are the things that you think China and the US have in common that they could focus on to build a stronger relationship? First of all, of course, there has been ups and downs in the relationship. But I think the current relationship is so frayed that uh, it's worse ever since Nixon's visit in 1972. And I also think that the relationship is beyond repair at this moment, at least within this current administration. We don't know what's going to happen in November, but I think we just have to expect the worst. Uh, I don't think that uh, there's a prospect of a major improvement in the relationship in the foreseeable future. Sorry to uh, give you this pessimistic uh, assessment, <laughs> but I think that's the reality uh, that we see today. Now, I wish so the relationship were much better because I spent so many years working in America receiving education. I love the country. And of course, I grew up in China and know the country very well. I hope the two countries can work with each other, cooperate with each other. The relationship today is very different from 40 some years ago, especially from the time when Nixon first visited in 1972. At the time, China was extremely poor. And China and America didn't have any economic relationship to speak of. Even 
many years after that, when the two countries established diplomatic relationship, 10 years after that, after Nixon's visit, there was hardly any economic relationship between the two countries to speak of. But today, both countries are each other's largest trading partners. And sometimes, now numbers change over time, especially since the trade war started about two years ago. So China exports a huge amount to America to a tune of six, 700 billion US dollars. America, of course, exports trade and services combined, probably about 200 billion dollars. So the, there is a great integration of the two economies today, which makes it very difficult, in fact, for them to decouple, even though decouple now is a cash word. Mm. Nonetheless, the relationship has become extremely great at this moment, and I don't think it's going to get better. So it is possible that the relationship, the economic relationship between the two countries will gradually decouple, although it will take a very long time for that to happen. You know, we have seen the trade war, we have seen a technology war, sanctions against Chinese companies, and you may even get into the finance area. I hope not, but uh, there are signs that would make me not so optimistic about that. So it could get even worse. And what do you think, uh, from your perspective, would that change if we saw a different president in November, if we do see Biden win? I think that uh, there is probably some bipartisan consensus in America with regard to the policy towards China, getting tougher with China, more demanding of what China should do to change its trade practices and other things. So I don't see a fundamental difference between either your Democrat or Republican president. However, I think that uh, Biden is likely to be more predictable and his policy is likely to be more stable. Under the current administration, what we have seen is unpredictability. You know, things just happen overnight without anybody expecting it. For example, America pulled out Paris Climate Accord, pulled out Iranian Nuclear Accord, pulled out the Open Sky Agreement, pull out TPP, the trade agreement in Asia, pull out WHO in the middle of pandemic, uh, basically undermined WTO. Uh, so it's dysfunctional at this moment, impose sanctions on international criminal court for investigating the conduct of American soldiers in Afghanistan. <laughs> All those things were part of the world order that America established. And America is tearing them apart, which is not something that we had expected just a few years back, you know, three or four years back. And I hope that uh, if there's a change of administration, uh, I think the world will become more normal. But uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen in November. So I wonder if we could talk a little about India as well. You spend time there. Uh, there's currently a border issue uh, between India and China. It's obviously been there for a while. But tell me how you see relations there and how you see relations developing. I think that India and China, of course, should have a very friendly relationship. They're neighbors with, with each other. If they are friendly with each other, both parties benefit from each other. The facts with regard to the border conflict are very murky. I try to figure out exactly what happened. It is a desolate part of the world. In fact, even more desolate than the Gobi Desert where I spend time. If I couldn't grow crops in the Gobi Desert, I wonder if anything grow at that altitude 
and uh, in that particular place. So I hope that both parties just come down and uh, you know, stick to the so-called line of actual control and try to avoid provoking each other, provoking each other and, and maintain a friendly, a stable relationship. So we don't get into uh, you know, all these worries that uh, we have today with regard to the relationship between the two countries. They can so much help each other. Tell me about the things that you are focused on now. You mentioned that you're uh, that you are working on another book. Can you give us any any insight into what that's about and what we might expect from there? I would rather that the audience reads this book first, out of the Golden okay. Story of China and America. But I I am in the process of uh, publishing my next book, whose title is Money Games. It's a story about a private equity deal, which is inside account of a major private equity deal, investment deal, from very beginning, negotiating, investing, taking control of the company, transforming the company, all the way to the exit, making money for investors. Nobody has ever done that. You know, you see books on investments, you see books on particular large deals, almost always written by reporters, by journalists, as an outsider, and almost always focusing on the deal cutting part of it, not how, what happened after you have closed the transaction, what happened to that particular company, eventually did you make money or did you lose money? For example, there's a book called uh, Barbarians at Gate, talking about the transaction by KKR acquiring uh, RJR Nabisco. And uh, it was $25 billion deal. And in the 1980s, that was a very, very big deal. Right? So it was a fascinating story. But nobody knew from reading that book because the book was written just about a year after the deal was cut. Nobody knew that in fact the investors stayed in that company for 15 years. They didn't get out until 15 years. And nobody knew whether or not investors actually made money out of that particular transaction. You will find out from my book. Although my book <laughs> is not about that particular deal, it's about another deal which will tell you the whole story from beginning to the end. Which I think for anybody in investment banking, the investments or students of business or business people who find it interesting. How do you mostly spend your time these days? Working on deals, making investments throughout Asia, mostly in India as well. We have a team in India, in Mumbai, and we're very active in the Indian market. We think there's a lot of potential in the Indian market. So we make a lot of efforts trying to invest in, to invest in India as well as other parts of Asia. And in my spare time, I just write. I published in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the Financial Times, Foreign Affairs, and some other publications in the past uh, two years. <laughs> I published on topics ranging from from uh, trade war to uh, uh, local politics. And finally, for, in for our audience- In addition to the, writing my books. <laughs> <laughs> for, for our audience, whose main, many are, are based in India, where are the areas that you are investing? Where do you see the most potential? We typically invest in businesses which cater to private consumption. In India, we do it a little differently. We tend to like businesses which also sell to foreign markets, the so-called outsourcing firms or exporting firms. The reason is that rupee has been pretty weak and sometimes volatile. So the currency risk is very high. If your revenue consists of hard currencies, then it mitigates your risk investing in that country. In contrast, when we invest in China, 
we stay away from export oriented businesses. And the reason for that is China's labor costs and currency are both rising, making the costs of inputs for export products more and more expensive every year. And because China has produced so much capacity, and therefore the prices for finished products have been either flat or dropping. So squeeze in between your profit margin becomes thinner and thinner. And that's why in China, we stay away from exports, but in India, we do the opposite. Uh, it really depends on the macroeconomic conditions of the country. But, but uh, without uh, India, we think India has great potential and we have a very motivated uh, team there to look at uh, transactions in India. We hope to deploy billions of dollars in that country. So thank you so much for being with us here today. I've really enjoyed our conversation and um, I can't wait to read the next book because I have to say, not only have I enjoyed uh, watching your interviews, but I've enjoyed reading it and I've actually recommended it to my international book club. So you'll have even more readers uh, of Out of the Gobi, Sean. Thank you very much. It's my honor and privilege to be here to speak with uh, your audience. I really appreciate it.